All right, so we have uh, spent some time on the form of the image of God in which we are created. All right, so we have, welcome. So we have some, uh, these are called uh, floralegia. You familiar with that term, Don Oso? It means picking flowers. That's what I thought. Select, not even not picking, selecting flowers. So these texts, this is an ancient practice of just collecting nice texts to illustrate uh, whatever, whatever you want to uh, do. But I guess today we call them proof texts. Um, and just like proof texts, so also with floralegia, what you have in front of you, the selection text. You can pretty much do anything, do anything with them that you want. You know, they don't prove anything. Um, people on different sides of the the debate can take the same floralegium and you know use it for their purposes. Um, so anyway, so um, your name? I'm Alina. Alina. Yes. All right. So Alina, we're talking about the. Um, mystery of man as male and female. And we're, we're striving to listen to hear the biblical vision. Uh, we've spent all summer on erotic desire, and now we're turning to part two, which is the mystery of man as male and female. So these are um, uh, further, these are not floralegia, because these are what I put together. They're not, they're not texts from ancient fathers or from scripture. Um, this is what I'm putting together to uh, summarize uh, what I see or what I hear as I'm trying to listen to the biblical vision. Um, that gender is the gate of ascent or descent. Gender is the vehicle of life and or death depending on how you choose, uh, what you choose to do. Uh, so male and female, gender is of the body, it's of the flesh. And so it's, it's visible, it's you know, in the three-tiered uh, uh, reality, visible, heart, heaven, gender is the visible. It's on the visible plane. It opens onto the heart, which opens onto heaven. So as flesh and body, um, as flesh or body, gender, male and female, together constitute this, uh, the visible temple of God. Um, with the flesh, uh, we are called to become spirit. Um, um, where there is neither male nor female in this ecstatic movement of erotic love. Ecstatic means coming out of oneself um, into the other in love. Um, erotic is ecstasis, it's an ecstasy, it's a coming out of oneself. Um, so that in the biblical, um, or in, let's say in the, in the church's um, vision of erotic love, uh, erotic love is quintessentially humble, selfless. Um, what we call erotic love in our cultures of the world for how long is perverted love, it's lust. But true erotic love is coming out of oneself and therefore it is by its very nature humble, uh, not grasping after what you want, but giving oneself to the other. In order to become one with God in the spiritual marriage of the tree of life as his holy temple. So this is what we were set before us last Sunday. So this Sunday, I'm adding this. Um, <laughs> and all of this is what I'm trying to get to. <laughs> I put it in front of you because there's so much material between here and there. So that even if we don't get there, at least you'll have it in front of you. Um, in the image of God, created in the image of God, male and female, men and women are embodiments of divine hypostatic love. Do you remember we talked about hypostatic love? And even of the incarnation. Um, so as the embodiments of divine love, um, and even of the incarnation that, that's to come, 
um, men and women, male and female, man as male and female, is called to be on an ecstatic movement, let's say, from ego to hypostasis. Now, that's what we need to explain. So this may be gobbledygook to you right now. I hope that we can translate it so that you understand it. Um, let's see. Uh, does anybody want pencil? I have pencils here for anybody who'd like to take notes. Tim, you at least look like you, you got that. Okay. Because I'm going to erase this. So if you want to save that, uh, you need to write it down. So I'll give you a few minutes to write it down if you intend to do that. So as I said, as I was starting to say, we spent some time on the form or the structure of the image. I'll put this off to the side, give you a chance to uh, write that down if you'd like. So we're talking, we were talking about the form of the image of God in whom we were made. What's going on up there? Okay. Um, so with that, let's, let, let's do a little bit of review and let's go to your Floralegia and let's look at uh, number one. Um, this, these are the steps by which we're tracing or mapping out the form of the image of God. So, um, inasmuch as we're calling it the mystery of man as male and female, because that's what it is, um, I am claiming, I am asserting that the mystery that encompasses or comprehends man as male and female is the mystery of God hidden from the eons and from the generations. You know, it just hit me even yesterday that we need to pay attention to this word generations. Uh, from the eons and from the generations, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the mystery of God. Now, in Colossians chapter 1.15, we read this, Christ is the icon of the invisible God. And you might underline, in whom all things were made. That is, the mystery of God hidden from the ages is the image of God in you. So when Christ says, when St. Paul says, the mystery of God is Christ in you, he's saying the image of God is in you because the image of God is Christ. Um, from Genesis, man is made as male and female in Christ. Because it says, let us make man according to our image and according to our likeness. So God made man, male and female, he made them in his image, in his likeness. Um, and we did say that the inversion of the preposition in was significant. And we answered the question, do you see a movement in that inversion? We said, yes, we do. There is a movement in that inversion. It is a movement from us in God to God in us. That's a movement. It is a Paschal movement. Uh, Paschal. Elena, I don't know your background, so just in case. It has to do with Easter. Pesach? Okay, you just answered a whole slew of questions there. <laughs> yes. Um, it's a Paschal movement because it is through his incarnation and his death, which is Pascha, that Christ comes not just to be in our form, which is given in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, who he who, was, who did not consider it to be robbery, to be equal with God, and it was in the form of God, and nevertheless you know, emptied himself and was found in the form, the schema, of, of man as a servant and he was subject in that form even to the, even to the point of death on the cross and it's in Hebrews 2.15 um, that augments this that um, because, the, his, his, because his brothers and sisters shared in flesh and blood he was not embarrassed or ashamed to share in the same and so he partook of our flesh and blood and together with Philippians uh, he partook of our flesh and blood for the purpose 
of becoming absolutely one with us to the point of dying with us. So he wasn't just found in the form of humanity. That's the point. He wasn't just found in the form um, and then kind of flew off when he was, when, when, you know, when the cross came. No, he died. And this is, this is, the, this is, the, this is the orthodox teaching um, that is, that is um, you know, <laughs> it is absolutely the center of the orthodox dogma. The one who died on the cross was the Son of God. It was not Jesus joined to the Son of God. It was God the Son who died in the flesh. So the point of that is that um, it is God who has become absolutely one with us in our death. And he's not just, you know, he's not just, how would you say, like uh, uh, attaching himself to a corpse and then making that corpse to live. God himself became the corpse. I mean, this, this, is, this is the central dogma. And I, and I, would, I would assert that, I would assert, only because I don't have time to demonstrate it, that this, is, this, gets, this gets to the heart, the heart of the difference between orthodoxy and heresy. And in fact, in the fourth sentence, in the fifth, fifth century, this was the test of orthodoxy. Who do you say died on the cross? And there were many who could not say God. It followed immediately from the early fourth century um, the uh, controversy over the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary. Is she Theotokos, you know, birth giver of God? Christotokos, birth giver of Christ. There were those who could go no further than to say that she was Christotokos because they could not, they could not see or believe or understand how God, who has no beginning, could come to be and take on a beginning and actually become a zygote in the womb of the Blessed Virgin. So those two, those two became the touchstone. You know? Who do you say was born of the Virgin? Who do you say died on the cross? Those became the touchstones of orthodoxy. Um, now, um, so it's a paschal movement, this, this inversion from us in God to God in us. We're seeing a movement, a paschal movement. God uniting himself to us. Um, can I erase this now? Ryasa was obviously made for liturgical purposes, <laughs> not for practical purposes. Now, here's from Originary of Alexandria, 1 B.C., Florilegium 1 B.C. Our primary hypostasis, he says, is our having been made in the image of God. Oh, yes. There are plenty. Origen is writing this in uh, the 200s, the third century. And uh, he's writing this, he's saying this in, in, a, in a context of uh, philosophical thought, philosophical, mythological thought, um, in which, you know, the... Uh, the, the intellectual world of the, the Near East, the Mediterranean, is um, gripped with the question, what is it that makes man to be man? You know, what is it? Or essence, that's, that's where essence comes from. What's the essence of everything? Uh, when, you, what, when you reduce everything from, when you take away all the properties, all the accidents, all the attributes, when you distill everything down to its final essence, what do you got? And uh, as you know, different answers were proposed. Well, the fundamental substance that stands underneath everything is earth. 
another philosopher comes along and says the fundamental stuff that stands underneath everything is water. Everything's just different forms of water. Another one comes along and says air. You know, everything's just a so many diff everything's just a different form of air, either rarefied or condensed. Another says fire. Um, no, everything is just a different form of fire. So this was the question that was, you know, gripping the intellectual world, the religious world of, of the ancient Near East. I think it was Empedocles who came along and said, no, actually the fundamental thing, uh, the fundamental stuff is love. But he meant something very different. When he said love, he probably meant a circle. Um, so that the circle is, the, is, the, is, the, is both the shape, uh, or let's say love is the stuff, circle is the shape. So what that means is that, I mean, this is basically, this is the mythological, uh, you know, the mythological um, experience of life. You have the beginning, um, you are born, you come, in, you come to be, and immediately you start on this circle of life, that ends right where, you be, where, right where you began. So beginning and end are the same. Um, and for Empedocles, love means that all of the many, the many particulars, uh, they're just dissolved back into the one. So for him, love is disillusion. And you see this. I mean, this this is like the the, the the fundamental theme of so many world religions. Um, and that will, and this is this is going this is going to be uh, this is going to be you're going to see the significance of origins definition. I hope in just a minute. Um, it's interesting to me. You know, I I, I, I mean, years ago I was reading from the. Uh, it was the Svetasvetara Upanishad. I mean, the Upanishads are beautiful texts. I think they're one of the most beautiful texts, religious texts, you know, of, of religious history. And I was struck by how um, the translator, I don't remember who it was, um, when he came to this word of, that, de that describes the final destiny of, of each one of us, you know, the self, the word that he chose was to dissolve into Brahman, to dissolve. This is the mythological view, understanding. And it's also significant, this will, this will become clear also as we proceed, that this beginning and the end come from and return to an original chaos, an undifferentiated chaos. This is actually the hypostasis, the substance. I mean, the, you know, so um, in the period of time, we're talking what? Uh, I mean, philosophy is born, what was it? Uh, remember, Tim? Six. Six? What's what? Yeah, when was he? Uh, 500? Okay, so we'll say 6th, 7th century BC. Um, I don't know even that they were using the word hypostasis. Its Latin equivalent would be substance. Um, but the hypostasis, as we said last Sunday, and its Latin translation means under. Stasis means standing. And so the hypostasis or the substance means what stands underneath everything. So here, the, you know, this is the vision. This is the mythological vision. Um, and the philosophical vision differs not a, not a whit, not a whit, except that the mythology is written in poetry, philosophy is written in prose. Um, philosophy and even modern day science has not, I don't, I mean, as I see it, it hasn't, the, the, myth, the mythological vision is, is real. It's, it's very much present. It's, uh, we're foolish to dismiss mythology as, as, as child, children's tales, it's not. It's the fundamental, it's the song of the soul, honestly. Um, but anyway, so uh, the question that people were asking, that you know, the philosophers were asking and trying to answer was, what's the hypostasis? What is our primary hypostasis? What is it that stands underneath 
um, everything that is and, and uh, that everything is ultimately from and is an instance of, okay? So, <laughs> it's in this context that origin of Alexandria, uh, who, was a, who was a fellow student with Plotinus, okay? He was one of the leading philosophers. Uh, what, he was Neoplatonism. Neo, Neo Is he like the father of Neoplatonism? Yeah, so you know, he's combining, he's, he's synthesizing, synthesizing Aristotle and Plato. So Origen was a fellow student with uh, Plotinus. So, he's, so Origen is in this philosophical milieu, uh, this religious philosophical milieu. I mean, let's, 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 uh, let's not demean it. it this, this, these men were serious. <laughs> they were serious. They were religious. Uh, they were devout. Um, and they were on a serious quest for the truth. So in this context, here's origin of Alexandria saying this. Well, our primary hypostasis, our primary stuff, is our having been made according to the image of God, which means that we have been made according to the to Christ which means we have been made according to the person of Christ. Now, just imagine, how does that change this? Think about it. What's now the beginning? Or who now is the beginning? What's underneath everything? Or, you're right, yeah, the Christ. Is Christ an undifferentiated mass? Exactly. Well, he's, not even, he's not part of God. He's holy God. <laughs> yeah, here's where, here's where language fails. He's holy God as the Father is holy God. The Son, the Spirit is holy God. So now what we see at the beginning is not undifferentiated chaos. But we see, well, for our sake, we will say, we see the person of Christ. I think maybe I'll bring it in now. I, I, I've been wondering how I would bring this in, but um, maybe I'll do it now. Let's go, go to your Florilegia, and let's go to the section, the passages from Revelations. Um, number 16, Florilegium 16. I am the Alpha and the Omega, Omega, says the Lord God. Now, Alpha is what? The beginning. The beginning. It's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last, the last letter, the end. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I contain the whole alphabet within myself, um, says the Lord God. He who is and who was, and the one who comes, the Pantocrator. I mean, that's a beautiful phrase, beautiful saying. He who is and who was, and the one who comes. Um, what's the category there? He who is and who was and the one who comes. It's time. Which means he embraces the whole of time. He's the beginning of time, he's the end of time. Time moves within him. Um, all right. Uh, the Pantakotor means one who is all powerful and whose power is active. Uh, number 17, I am the first and the last, and the one who lives, um, I have here conferred John eleven twenty five. 25, that's where he says to Martha, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. He's talking to Martha at the tomb of Lazarus. And I came to be dead, and now this is, and this is good, this, this, you know, this, this is marvelous. I mean, it's, it's um, I came to be dead. Who came to be dead? I came to be dead. Who is he? The first and the last. The one who is, the one who was, the one who's to come. That's, I mean, you know, um, this, this is nonsense. This is philosophical nonsense. Um, I came to be dead. And behold, I am living unto the ages of ages, and I hold the keys of death and of the unseen, or, or Hades. Uh, number 18. 
I'm the Alpha, uh, from Revelations chapter 21. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And here the word for beginning is Arhi, which, um, you know, is the same word that we find in Genesis 1.1, in the Arhi, in the beginning, and also in John 1.1, uh, in, in the beginning, in Arhi, was the word. And the word for end, I have it here, um, for is, is telos, the Greek word is telos, which means end in, the ter in terms of perfected, finished, um, consummated. The goal has been accomplished. So I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, for a number 19 from Revelation 22. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Now he uses the word eschatos, which is a different word, uh, meaning the very last. There's nothing more after it. Uh, the beginning and the end. Uh, again, the same word, telos. Um, so here we have, and we have the same shape. You see, we have the same shape that we just drew here. But now this substance which stands underneath we you know what maybe what we should have did we should have put the beginning for sake of illustrative purposes at the bottom so here's the beginning and here's the hypostasis whatever it is that stands underneath everything so we have the same shape that we have in mythology the mythological um, f um, structure. But we have a completely different hypostasis, which is Christ. So when we come into being from the beginning, we're not coming into being from some undifferentiated primordial soup. Um, you know, the can that, uh, that contain, it's like, you know, I don't know, like, you know, you put your, you're boiling some soup on the stove and it's got all kinds of ingredients in there, but they're all just kind of a mass. And when you eat the soup, you eat them all together. Um, so you take out a spoonful, maybe but you just got potatoes and celery there. Take it another spoonful here, you got a little bit of beef. Okay, now you've, now you've drawn out um, each one of us <laughs> and that's the beginning so now you're destined the beef is destined to go back into the soup so is the potato and the celery and it's all together again um, but here we do not come from an undifferentiated mass we come from the person of God the Son he is the first he is the last um, so when we end, what is our end called to be? We come, from, we come from the mystery of Christ. We're called to go back to the mystery of Christ. So again, we're not dissolving into some undifferentiated soup and some, into some kind of chaotic mass. We don't dissolve. That's the whole point. We don't dissolve because Christ does not dissolve. Tim? Well, just to add what you're saying here, at least among the ancient Greeks, and I guess it's in the Polish as well, dissolving into the primordial chaos um, oftentimes it requires either trauma or the yeah. use of hallucinogenic yeah, 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 yeah. So you're altering your mind or you're traumatizing yeah. the ritual participant. Yeah, which yeah. Is not which is intended to dissolve it. Yes, yes. So it's another ayahuasca. That's what ayahuasca. What, what? Yeah, ayahuasca. Well, there's different, different ways of doing it. But at least okay. The Greeks, the Dionysia, okay. Right? So in mythological terms, you understand what they're trying, what, what's going on there. It's, it's this impulsion, this impulsion. I call it an impulsion of the soul to get back to the beginning by going to the end. Because when you come to the end, you come to the beginning. And in the beginning... Um, everything's new, so it's this—it's it's like this, this, this pull of the soul. It just—it just 
you, you, you can't stop it. I mean, the soul is just, it's moving according to a certain principle. You just, and it's, it's wanting to get back to the beginning. And to get back to the beginning, you've got to get back to the end. So, um, so this is what's going on um, in those. That's a mythological, uh, you know, it's, it's, a myth, it's, a, it's an effort to get back to the beginning according to mythology, not according to theology. Now, I just said that we come from, when we begin, we do not begin from an undifferentiated mass, and so we do not dissolve back into an undifferentiated mass because Christ does not dissolve. And this is the point of the doctrine of the Trinity that we were talking about last Sunday. We have one essence, divine essence, which we said, we said, uh, we simply repeated uh, the teaching of the church. This divine essence is absolutely, altogether unknowable and unpartakeable. Um, how then can we know God? How can we even relate to God if he's this essence? And here's the thing. If the essence of God, in other words, that which is common to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of the persons of the Trinity, if that's what's underneath, if the essence is the hypostasis, then the essence forms, as it were, the boundary for the hypostases. And so now the hypostases are, as it were, determined by the essence. I'm drawing the picture that I have in my mind when I describe this, in the hopes of helping you to see it, because this is not Sunday school stuff. <laughs> Can you see that? So if the essence is unpartakeable, if it's unknowable, that means that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are unpartakeable and unknowable. That means that if the Son of God is going to um, connect to the world in some way, he can't do it himself because he's caught in the essence. So what he has to do is he has to, I don't know, and here's, here you have the, the Latin doctrine that was developed, I don't know the history of it, of the created energies. He creates these energies, you know, uh, fall, you know, and through these created energies, now he connects with man and the world. And this is what Nestorianism, what the, what, uh, a heresy in the, in the uh, late 4th, early 5th uh, centuries, um, this is what, uh, that's what it's, it was, that um, God the Son connects to Jesus the human being, the man. And that's the Christ. The Christ then is the Son of God and the Son of the Virgin. But you see here that the uh, Son of the Virgin is not the Son of God, it's, the, it's a human being, it's a male. So this is a heresy in your description. This is a heresy. And honestly, I don't see any different from, uh, from uh, Islam. Islam also teaches a virgin birth, that Jesus was born of a virgin Mary. But Jesus is not God, he's just a prophet. Um, so yeah, so this is heresy. And what you, can, what you see here is that there's no incarnation. Because God the Son does not become flesh. He joins himself to Jesus. There's another version of this. And that is, it's called, um, you know, the, the, like the, the uh, polar opposite of Nestorianism would be Apollinarianism. <clears throat> which are in turn, uh, you know, they're just, the, they're just devolutions of the earliest heresies. On the one hand, you had Adoptionism. On the other hand, you had uh, Docetism. Um, the appearance that, Jesus, that, Jesus, that God appeared to be man, but he wasn't really. So Apollinarianism, Docetism, uh, works on this same principle. Only here you have God the Son uh, creating a human flesh and depending on what stage of Apollinarianism you're in, a human soul. But God the Son takes the place of the human mind. Or if you're dealing with a, you know, with a dualism, um, God the Son takes the place of the soul. So you have this body, which would be the created energy, which would be a created something 
so that God the Son can dwell in here. But again, you don't see an incarnation. Because God, because this is not man. Man is not a shell. Man, you know, man is um, body, soul, and mind. Well, if God is taking the place of the mind, or if God is taking place of the soul, what you have is a monster. Something that is neither man nor God. So anyway, I don't know exactly, how, oh yes. So I was, I was wanting to show how this understanding of God in which um, the essence is conceived as the hypostasis, is that which stands underneath. I want to just show its Christological implications as well. Um, but I also want you to see how this understanding is no different, in my mind, it's no different from the um, mythological vision, or let's say from the mythological poem, or from the philosophical uh, prose. It's no different, the same vision. And so in those, on that basis, uh, which I'm describing very briefly, um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is for what it's worth. Um, this is no charge for this extra. Um, this is why I am, I, I am of the opinion that so much, of, so much that passes for Christian theology is in fact, it's just ancient pagan philosophy wrapped in, Christ, wrapped in Christian terms. There's been no movement from the philosophical to the theological. Here's the orthodox understanding, to the degree that we can, and how are you going to draw this? I mean, we are, the hypostasis, that which stands underneath, is not the essence. It's not some indifferentiated, unpartakeable, unknowable mass. The hypostasis is the Father. That is to say, the Father is what, it's the hypostasis of the Father that stands underneath absolutely everything. I say the Father, because the Son is begotten from the Father. Now watch how I'm drawing this. I'm supposed to be just tracing this line. Here's the Son. The hypostasis of the Son, who comes, who was begotten from eternity, from the Father. There was never a time when the Son was not. So the Son has always been begotten of the Father. I mean, you know, we're talking about a mystery. We can't explain it. And the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, not from the Father and the Son, because now you've reduced the Trinity to a dyad, you know, to, to, to a, to two things. And you've also reduced the Holy Spirit from an hypostasis, or from a person, to a link that, you, that binds the Father to, and the Son together. You've lost the hypostatic character, the personal character of the Holy Trinity. So the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Now, I want you to see what I've done here. I'm actually drawing from St. Gregory Nanzianza, St. Gregory the theologian of the fourth century, because this is what he says in one of his theological orations. He does not draw one diagram of the Trinity, as is what came to me last Sunday as I was reflecting on what we had done, and as I have reflected on my attempts over the last how many years to draw an orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. I don't know how you would do it. There's this doctrine that you may have learned in certain theological textbooks, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but you see how that is wrong? <laughs> because here you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit trapped in the essence. The triangle is the, is, the, is the hypostasis. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are just angles of the triangle. All right? And that's wrong. And so we can't draw just one diagram of the Holy Trinity. We have to draw two. I'm drawing from St. Gregory of the Theologian. This is what St. Gregory of the Theologian says. When I contemplate Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, my, draw, my mind is drawn to see one, the three lights as one light. I don't remember exactly how his, how his um, thinking is going here, but something like this. When I contemplate the three, my mind, because each one is fully God, <laughs> Elena, each one is holy God, um, my mind is drawn to see one light. But when I contemplate the one light, I see three lights, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we actually have to draw two diagrams. And uh, even that, I don't know how you would do it, but it's something like this. From here, you get, you get this, and then you have this, maybe this, and maybe this, where you have this is the essence, and these circles would be the hypostases, the persons. So that um, St. Gregory will say, and this, you know, this is in the fourth century. 
And I mean, St. Gregory is articulating the theological uh, mind of the church. Um, but you understand, you have, let's understand, um, the church in the fourth century, actually starting with the third century, is um, starting to move into, from the Bible, from the Bible, which is a theological vision, from the Bible into the philosophical world of, of, the, of the Greek Empire, the Alexandrian Empire. And so in the third and fourth century, they're encountering this, this philosophical vision, you know, of God, man, and the world, which has already a long history of its own vocabulary. And so the church is moving into this. And now it's, and now it's trying to, so now it's, it's, it, it needs to figure out how to articulate the theological vision of the Bible in these terms of its, um, you know, the ones it's missionizing, you know, the, 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 the philosophers and, and the Greek culture, to translate it into the terms of philosophy without losing the theological vision, which is beyond human mind, the human mind's ability to comprehend. You know, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Um, to translate that into the language of philosophy without losing that theological vision and without letting the theological vision of the Bible get swallowed up into the, philosoph the highly sophisticated the uh, philosophical vision of the philosophers. So St. Gregory, a theologian, one, the theologian, one of his the, we, he's one of the few, he's one of the three that we call the theologian. Along with St. John, who wrote the, the Gospel and the Apocalypse, and along with St. Simeon. The new theologian was what, in the 1200s, was it? Ninth, ninth century? Um, um, he's articulating it. He's, a, he's, he's articulating the theology of the church, and he says it like this. The Divine, let's see, the divine hypostases, the three hypostases are those in whom divinity exists. Now, where we started with all of this was to show how, it just shows the significance of the fact that Christ is the beginning and the end. He does not dissolve. He does not dissolve into the Father. He does, the, he does not dissolve into the Holy Spirit. None of the three persons dissolve into the other. This is the mystery. You look at all three and you see one God. You look at one God, you see three persons. The mind just keeps going back and forth, back and forth, and it cannot dissolve one into the other. Nor can we say that there are three gods because there's one God. <laughs> Nor do we say that there's one person, because there are three persons. The mind is going back and forth. It's not the loud, mind is not being allowed to rest in itself. So the mind is constantly being kicked out of itself to, re to reflect upon God in a way that is beyond intellection. So the significance of this is that the beginning and the end itself is not an undifferentiated mass. The beginning and the end itself is the particular person of Jesus, of Christ, incarnate. Jesus Christ. Now, so do you see that? <laughs> um, so that's, that's what we're focusing on right now. There's another aspect of this that we could bring in, and that is that the hypostasis, as that which is outside the essence, it's just not governed by the essence, you know, by the properties of the essence, the hypostasis, which, which might be unpartakeable and um, um, unknowable, uh, the hypostasis, since it exists outside of those, um, is not bound by them. So the hypostasis, even though it is unknowable in his essence, is knowable in the mystery of his self, of his person, of his hypostasis. Now, okay, but so that's, that, that, that gets us into... Uh, We'll, we'll come back into we'll perhaps we'll come back to that. We'll probably need to come back to that. But to going back here to this this, this uh, structure of time as beginning and end. So in mythology uh, and in philosophy, time that moves from here, from the beginning to the end, since it's always moving back to the end, time 
in a sense, does not really exist. And in fact, reading from Mircea Iliadi, he's the one that I've been reading the last two weeks. This is why I'm all up on this. Um, he says primitive man as well as modern man. Modern man in a much more sophisticated way, so it's much harder for us to see how we're doing this. But uh, the mythology of the primitive religions is still with us. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, even the modern man, the primitive man, he says, their effort is to abolish history. They want to abolish history. Uh, because history is the movement from this primordial bliss of unity where uh, everything is, um, you know, uh, new and whatever. And it's a falling away from, it's a separation from that unity. And so in order to find meaning, in order for there to be meaning in my daily life, the only way it can have meaning is if I'm going back to the end through these kinds of rites that you're talking about and other kinds of rites. So that time has no real meaning, has no real, um, no real existence. In this mythological structure where the hypostasis would not be the second person of the Trinity, but it would be the undifferentiated mass of chaos. Uh, exemplified, for example, in, for example, in the Babylonian myth, in the, in the mingling of the sweet waters and the bit, bitter waters, the god and the goddess, Apsu Tiamat. Um, but now, <laughs> okay, let's see, we're going to have to wrap this up because we've got to get upstairs. Um, we're, we're focusing on movement, you know, on how, how, the, how in, in the, the, the form of the image of God in whom we were made is the hypostasis of Christ. The form of that image is hypostatic, that is to say it's personal, it's ecstatic, that is to say it's, it, it, it is outside of its essence. Uh, it's erotic, that is to say it's moving out of itself. That is the form of the image that we're in, that, that, that we exist in. Um, but this image that we exist in is itself the beginning and the end, as we have been reading from Revelations. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to run through this. Uh, there's lots that I would want to say about this particular point, but I'm just going to make this point, and if, you know, we'll have to come back to it next Sunday and, and finish it out. I want you to see this, that Christ is the beginning and the end. Let's put it in biblical terms. As the beginning, what is he? I know, that's a, that's a wide open question. What I'm after is, as the beginning, Christ is the image in whom we were made. How is he the end? What is the end? What's the end all about? How did he get to be the end? How? Pascha. Pascha. His death on the cross. What does he say on the cross? It is finished. The word he uses is telos. It is telos. It's perfected. I want you to see this. The Christ is the beginning as the image in whom we are made. He is the end, the telos, as the crucified God who was risen from the dead, but in whose crucifixion he has become absolutely one with us. I'm going to say Pascha. I'm going to say the death of God, which is shocking to many. But that is the orthodox doctrine. Now, brothers and sisters, listen. Do you see a movement from image to Pascha? Do you see a movement? And where does that movement take place? You know, what's, what's the venue? Uh, what's the vessel in which this movement from first to last takes place? What is that movement? Time. Suddenly time has meaning. Um, time is the movement. Time isn't just this, you know, I don't know what you would call it, this, this, the, this, this measurement of the movement of sun and moon. Time now is the movement of God descending to earth. And how does he descend to earth? By the Theotokos ascending to God when she is gone, when she, go, when she ascends to the temple and spends her life in the temple and says yes to God. What, I, what, I, what I ask you to see here, and you can contemplate this over time, 
Time now is revealed as the movement of erotic love between Christ and his church, his bride, the exemplar, the image, the prototype of male, female. We exist, we move through time in this mystery of erotic love, the God's erotic love for us, the, the bride. So the goal is for us to get into our bridal chamber, the heart, right? To meet the bridegroom and be transfigured. And to produce and become, as, as the saints would say, to become ourselves, Theotoki, mothers of God. All right, we got to go upstairs. But I have, hope I have finished it enough that you have something firm to grab onto and to think about this week. We'll come back to it. 